changing who's at the top isn't isn't really going to make a material difference. You know, that person is still going to, you know, protect cops who who kill people, you know, choose not to to prosecute, choose not to even use language that, that you know, they they have a huge PR budget. They choose how they frame situations and if you think the chief has nothing to do with that, then you're wrong. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Here in L.A., Chatsworth Edition. Today, we talk with Catherine Tattersfield. Catherine is a native Angelina, a valley girl, now a valley woman, who is an activist and community organizer. She does a lot of the groundwork for some of your favorite politicians and causes by going door to door usually in the Valley, and educating prospective voters about the issues and candidates they'd probably want to know about. Every now and then, she'll run across a billionaire or a scoundrel and ask them some uncomfortable questions and tweet it out. And for that reason alone, you should love her. So we talked about local politics, going to school in the Val, and where to get soul food in the nether regions of uh, Chatsworth, typically known for porn. <laughs> So please welcome Catherine Tattersfield. Hey everybody, we are here with Catherine Tattersfield. Hey, hey. Yay! <laughs> Catherine is such a a good Angelino <laughs> that you have been writing metro all day today in the rain that's right <laughs> you even went down to city hall today uh not city hall it's like a offshoot of the city clerk's office it's real it's closer to union station but you know that's where you go to uh file your petitions and stuff for as a city council candidate or any city race you know mm -hmm. so i was down there to sign some petitions i'd forgotten to put my address on but <laughs> that's okay because at least they give you the opportunity to correct it so, Catherine, you are okay. One, first of all, thank you for being here on this terrible, <laughs> sure. rainy day. For sure, thank um, you for having me. Of course, and one of the reasons that we're having you today is, first of all, you know a lot about the valley. I do. Secondly, you are really active in local politics. That's right. And blending the two together, you knock on the doors yes. in the valley. I do, yeah. So I would say there's very few people who know as much about the valley as somebody who knocks on the doors because right. a postman just kind of puts the letters in the, in the box. Sure. You actually get to talk to the people. Yeah, and, and have conversations about really you know salient issues in the communities, yeah. So, okay. First of all, I'm nervous for you because when people knock on my door now, yeah. I mean, in 2023 now, right, right, it's trouble. Yeah, usually. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. Speaking of trouble, you're getting a phone call from yeah. from probably the new mayor. Yeah. Right. Same thanks for knocking on the doors. Um, do people when they when they do open the door, are they suspicious of you right away? Some people are, some people aren't. You know, I think it depends on, uh, a lot of it depends on their mood, just whether they're having a good day or not. And, you know, sometimes it depends on just really the type of person that they are. You know, if they have a lot, they have a ring and they have a lot of security in the home that you can visibly see, then, yeah, usually those folks will talk to you from behind a screen or, uh, you know, like a metal gate kind of thing where you can't even really see oh. their appearance so you don't know if you're talking to the right voter that you have on your list. Right. You know, but other people are, are just, you know, very welcoming. Oh, hang on just a second. They'll just walk right out the door. And those are the people that you probably know you're going to have a good conversation with. Nice. Right. Yeah. It, so are those people even worth it, though? Because they probably already agree with your, whatever your agenda was for that day? Well, that is part of it. Yeah, you do want to talk to the people who are most receptive to your message, mm -hmm. you know, because otherwise you're going to be, you only have so much time to knock on doors and so much energy. And it, it's such a labor intensive process that you don't want to spend your time with people who are not going to be receptive to your message, right? You're going to, you're going to move them a little bit, but it's not the same as deep canvassing where the whole goal is to have just that conversation. You know, if you're trying to get voters mobilized, then no, you, you don't want to spend your time on somebody who's, you know, just going to argue with you and essentially waste your time when there's other people right down the street who are going to be happy to see you, happy to support, you know, excited about the vision and the movement. 
you know, that makes a lot of sense. Right. Uh, because in L.A., we don't turn out to vote. Yeah. Even yeah. even now that we can do it online. You get a ballot in the mail. Everybody yeah. gets a ballot in the mail. It's super simple. The voting centers are open 10 days. You know, I, I don't know if that's going to be the same in the CD6 special election. I don't know that there's been a special election since they changed the parameters of the voting process. So it might be a little bit different. But, yeah, it is super easy to participate. So, mm-hmm. you know, that one-on-one interaction is proven to increase turnout for sure. When I say online, I mean register online. Right. I wish we could vote online. When yeah, vote. I know. And that's the thing, too. A lot of the process is so antiquated. You know, when you talk about getting signatures for a candidate, you have to physically do it in person. Mm. So many people ask you, well, can I just do this online? Can I just look at the candidates online and pick and then sign? No, you can't. Mm-hmm. You know, I wish that you could. It would be so much easier to do this whole process. But they that's not how the city works, you know. So you mentioned CD6. Yeah. What does CD6 entail? What neighborhoods? CD6 is the neighborhoods that were formerly represented by Nuri Martinez before she resigned. Oh, those were hers. Yeah, that was Nuri's uh, council district. So you're looking at, you know, Van Nuys and Lake Balboa, which is, you know, the same, but not the same, I guess. (laughs) And then, (laughs) yeah. And then you have um, Arlita, Sun Valley, Panorama City, a little bit of Pacoima, a little bit of NoHo. So, you know, these are very working class communities. You know, it's overwhelmingly a brown, you know, district. It's like 70 percent, you know, people of color. Hmm. It's uh, it's absolutely working class. The median income is like 46,000 or something per household. By the way. She is just ripping this information off the top of her head. <laughs> Nailed all the neighborhoods. You know the demographics. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, you got to know your voters, right? You got to know, you know, where to hit, where the most engaged people are in, in the community. That's where you start, you know, and then you can kind of move in and, and bring in other people who feel very disengaged and disenfranchised in the entire process. Right? So uh, once upon a time, were you knocking on doors for Nuri in CD6? No. I was never. <laughs> no. You dodged a bullet on that one. No, I was never involved with uh, Nerd Martinez at all. In fact, um, the group that I was part of, West Valley People's Alliance, um, Nerd Martinez did not like West Valley People's Alliance at all. You guys were too punk rock. Uh, yeah, too too punk rock, and um, she did not like uh, mutual aid efforts in her district. What? Yeah, that was okay. A, hold on, a common theme. <laughs> a lot of people don't know some of these terms that we're throwing around. Right, right. That's true. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't mutual aid when you give food and blankets and right. yeah. things like that to like people living on the streets? Yeah, people who are experiencing homelessness. You know, they need a variety of things, and there was a lot of mutual aid work, and there still is, um, particularly on Etna Street um, in Van Nuys, really close to the Sepulveda Metro Station, and that is Nuri, Nuri's former district, and she she didn't like it at all she didn't want you know folks she she looked at it as you know encouraging people to remain on the streets and mm. you know just detrimental to public safety in the district when right yeah which is which is i can understand that if you're on top of an ivory tower she lives in Sun Valley. You'd think that she would see the immediate need for this. You know, Sun Valley is one of the, you know, most underprivileged in the whole valley, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's a community that has some of the worst air quality in the entire city. Does it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sun Valley has horrible air quality. Because we had a realtor on here last year. Uh huh. And people asked, where can I buy a house for... He's like, Sun Valley. Yeah, for <laughs> yeah. under like a million bucks. That, that is it. That's yeah. not like far, far away. Right, right. That's Sun Valley. Yeah, you could, you could buy a house. that's why. That is why, yes, because it's a really high condensed pollution you know area because there's just no breeze to clear it there, out there's no breeze but there's also like there's a, a rock quarry there's like uh there's some oil you know there it's there, it's a lot of like fossil fuels and, and a lot of manufacturing mm. you know so i mean to a degree it's unavoidable but it's also like hey let's not have polluters right smack in our community right you know and that's kind of the middle of the valley right yeah it, it is yeah and it's you know it's, it's got the hills right behind it so it sort of traps everything yeah in and it's just it's just not a good, good place to live you know mm-hmm. and, and it could be right it has a lot of potential to be much better quality of life for the people who are there i am so happy to have a valley expert on here <laughs> because um one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast is I've lived in L.A. since the 80s, uh-huh. and 
I thought I knew a lot about LA. Right. But when it really comes down to it, I have blind spots. Sure. And two of my blind spots are the Valley and right. South LA. And I, I mean, think, then, yeah. I think a lot of people have those. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Unless we have like romantic partners who are out there or we sure. work out there. Yeah. You grew up where? I grew up in um, like Woodland Hills, Canoga Park area. So oh, nice. Yeah. So I was born and raised in the San Fernando Valley. I was born in Kaiser Panorama. So <laughs> <laughs> Over by my favorite Walmart. Yeah. Right. The, the, you know, the Panorama Mall Walmart is popping always. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually love the Panorama Mall. You you are a minority in that. I am yeah, for sure. Yeah, it has it has a not a good rep. Yeah, it's like a. There's a, maybe because I'm a lot older than you, but I admire like the retired grandpas who use the massage chairs. Yeah, yeah, and, they're always there. I know it doesn't matter what time of day you're there either. They watch soap operas always, on their phones. Yeah, there's always <laughs> folks just chilling there, you know and. Yeah, I mean, it's just very reflective of the community itself, right? There's a lot of empty storefronts mm -hmm. inside the facility. I mean, that's the case with any mall, but it's not really like that at the Topanga Mall, right? right. Like, there's a couple empty storefronts. It's not like the Topanga, the Panorama Mall. And I, and I bet you the Walmart doesn't help that mall. I mean, it, it, not really, no. I mean, the traffic's kind of concentrated in the Walmart and um, the, the Food for Less is over there. And it, yeah, it doesn't really trickle into the mall the way that, you know, I'm sure it was framed that way. Right. right? And it got here in the 90s, right? Like, they built that shit in the 90s. It was kind of supposed to, like, revitalize that mall. And that's, mm -hmm. that's just not how it went down, right? No. <laughs> it's hard for a mom and pop anything to compete against the Walmart yeah, price. Yeah, no, you, you can't. Yeah, and uh, it's it, it duplicates almost everything that was available inside the mall. So mm -hmm. there's really no incentive to explore the other retailers. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what high school did you go to? Canoga. Did you go to college? Yes. Which, where'd you go? I went to CSUN. You stayed true, in the valley. True, true valley. That's right. <laughs> true valley, yes. Do, did a lot of your uh, classmates at Canoga go to CSUN? Um, not really. Uh, Canoga isn't what you, what, it's not like designed for people to go to college. At least it wasn't when I was there. It's more, uh, the thought process that you're just going to go and work and be a worker bee. Really? So, yeah. So unless you were in like AP classes or something like that, there wasn't a lot of emphasis, at least when I was there on attending college. Huh. Yeah. It was, it was more about just, you know, preparing you to go and, and work and really, yeah. What motivated you to go to college? Working at Taco Bell. <laughs> yeah, that I was. How so? Yeah, I was just like this. This can't be my life because, <laughs> you know, at the store that I worked at, um, the the person who was the the manager of the store, right? Not a, you know, regional manager or anything like that. Manager of the one store had worked there for thirty fucking years. Oof. Right, and you and I'm sitting there and I'm like nineteen years old and I'm like. 30 years and that's it, you know, right. like, wow. And I also started to notice that, you know, they would have meetings for like the regional managers and stuff at that store and they were all men. Mm. And, you know, this manager of my store was a woman and I just thought, okay, maybe this game is rigged, you know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe there's a reason why she's only got this far in 30 fucking years. Right. So I was just like, well, if I go to college, maybe I, I can get around that. And, you know, it wasn't a perfect solution, but I, I still feel that I did make the right choice. But I also had the ability to make that choice. Right. I had an opportunity that most people don't have. You know, I, I had money from my parents to pay for college. Mm -hmm. Everybody should have that same opportunity, yeah. right? Regardless of where you go to school, regardless of who you were born to, you should have the opportunity to go to college. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, stay at home uh, and commute to CSUN? I had an apartment. I Great. Yeah, I, I had an apartment for a while by myself with a roommate. And, and so then, you the full you know, college experience. Basically, yeah. I mean, I didn't live on campus. I didn't live in the dorms. But yeah, I had I had a good college experience, you know, right here in the valley. It's possible. <laughs> so you were into politics 
as a kid, probably. Yeah, yeah. I was a, I was that weird kid that like read Time magazine because you know my parents had a subscription, and yeah, I was a big freak. I was like, <laughs> I remember being six years old and, and and being in the back of my friend's car and and talking about like a Senate race, and his mom like was like, "Can you please stop talking about this? This is creepy." <laughs> You know, it's like you're a couple little kids. Can't you talk about like I, the Dodgers or the Ninja Turtles or something, you know, normal? And <laughs> was it like Bob, Barbara Boxer should retire? Yeah, it, it was about Barbara Boxer at the time. You know, she was I, I believe that was the first time she ran for Senate. So, you know, that's how old I am. Uh-huh. But yeah, like she, you know. It was it was that conversation. <laughs> At six years old, that's fantastic. When I was like six, yeah. Were your parents into politics? Is that what got my you? My dad was obsessed, but my dad was a hardcore Republican. Really? So yeah, so it was sort of like the the motivator as a as a young you know growing up, like absorbing his ideology, and then realizing how wrong it was and rejecting it as an adult. You know? How did you know it was wrong? I mean, you get hints over the years, you know, that it's wrong, but it still feels right, you know, at least for me, you know, I still kind of clung to that. But when I got to college, really, and that that's how college really helped me wasn't just, you know, academically, you know, learning about stuff was just realizing that these stupid things that I learned growing up were not right and that there was a much better way to do things and a much better way to approach life and other people, mm. you know. Were you, were were you active in uh, uh, school politics? Were you? I didn't. I no. I didn't you never do, ran for anything. I didn't run for anything. I was completely like disengaged from that part of school. I was just there to, you know, take my classes, and and that was kind of it. I was like a, I I, I guess I could call myself a pre law student. Mm-hmm. You know. So what was um, what was your your one of your favorite aha moments about politics while being a poli sci major at CSUN? Definitely reading um, Obama's Audacity of Hope. You know, that I read uh, Dreams from My Father when I was at Pierce, and then I read, you know, The Audacity of Hope. And, you know, I, it's, it's naive looking back on it, but at the time, it, it made a big impression on me. And because of Obama, I read um, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. You know, and that was assigned to me in high school, and I did not read it because I did not care, you know? It, it, isn't it crazy that we give... <laughs> young people yeah i wouldn't these have, deep books. i wouldn't have understood it anyway so i'm i'm glad that i did that as a young adult versus as a teenager because i got so much more out of it that way yeah you know and that really helped me see and deconstruct the things that my father taught me that were wrong hmm. you know uh, were, are you old enough to have voted for Obama? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I voted for Obama. So yeah. did you help his campaign, too? Did you start knocking on doors then? I did not start knocking on doors. I had, like, five T-shirts, <laughs> but I didn't think about engaging in it that way. And I really wish that I had, because I had the time, right? Mm-hmm. If I have the energy to do it now at this age, imagine how well I could have done it back then. So but, wh- wh- who you did know. you knock on doors for first? The first person was actually a friend of mine who ran on uh, for the neighborhood council. He's still a board member. His name's Jeff Williams. Love you, Jeff. But the first, like... Which uh, which neighborhood council are we talking? Chatsworth. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that wasn't a lot. It was like eight doors because there's like hardly anybody on the list. So <laughs> so really, it was Shervin Azami for Congress, right? Yeah. The homie Shervin, yeah. How did he do? He didn't win, you know, the primary, but we were up against the political machine that is Brad Sherman. Anybody knows about Bali politics knows Brad Sherman. He's been my congressman almost my entire life. He's been in there for over 26 years, and it is time for you to get the fuck out, Brad. (laughs) I don't, know any, I don't know anything about Valley politics. Please retire, Brad. What is your issue with uh, Congressman uh, Sherman? Uh, there, where do I start? You know, I mean, <laughs> the guy has a seat basically just to be part of the war machine. You know, if you look mm. at his contributions, it's almost all from like, you know, big financial firms. And, and he paints himself as a progressive, which is the really you know, disturbing part of it because he's he, a Democrat. He Oh, yeah, yeah. He's a Democrat. He But, you know, he's. 
he's a member of the progressive caucus and he does absolutely nothing progressive but you know he'll put his name on he'll co-sign a bill and then he'll go back and tell his constituents how great and progressive he is and, mm. and he attacked Shervin as being too progressive and all this. So, so you're a progressive and now all of a sudden this other candidate comes in and now you're not progressive and that mm. guy's the nightmare too progressive you know it was just a wild thing to watch has he voted for anything recently that was just out of I bounds? will never forgive that motherfucker for voting for the Iraq war way back then way back well, then well I mean Hillary did too Hillary did too and you know I I I do fault her for I fault Do you both. forgive Hillary? No, not not for that. I mean I mean for what what do we mean about forgive because I didn't see anything from her two campaigns, right, that really addressed that in a meaningful way. That was one of the things that drew me to Obama as a college student was that he pledged to end the Iraq war. Did he really do that the way that he said? Okay, no. But, you know, <laughs> Hillary wasn't even talking about right. really ending that war. So I felt yeah. like there was no real, you know, progress there. I, I, okay, please correct me if I'm wrong about okay. this. I feel like some politicians, Brad Sherman accepted not him (laughs) but people like hillary Mm -hmm. because she's a woman right because she's got that clinton monkey on her back yeah she has a lot of baggage has to do some things that she kind of holds her nose at yeah like that because at that time the whole country was in favor of just blow up anything yeah 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 and and as a do you am, am i wrong to think that no, Maybe I, no, she I can't think, be idealistic about no, that. Vote. I, I think that's fair. I think it's especially because as a female candidate, you know, she didn't want the perception, oh, she's soft right. on, you know, war and terrorism and all that stuff. So I do understand as a political calculation yeah. making that move. That's just not how I want to see people govern. So right. I understand it from a logical standpoint, and I understand it from a standpoint of wanting to obtain or hold on to your power. Mm-hmm. Now, let's uh, let's talk about another female politician. Maybe you knocked on doors for Mayor Karen Bass. I, I did not knock on any doors for Mayor Bass. No. You're a Gina person, right? <laughs> I, yes. Team Gina for life. Gina Viola is a good friend. She's an organizer, and she was our candidate. And, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing now with the new mayor just in a few weeks why we wanted Gina in there, you know, because Gina had a very different approach to homelessness and criminalization and, you know, a lot of very pressing issues in our city. You don't think uh, Mayor Gina would have appointed uh, Chief Michael Moore to you know, be I just, the yeah, CEO of the yeah, homeless? You know, I just don't see, G- you know, Mayor <laughs> Gina doing that. No, you know, that was one of Gina's. You know, Highlights was talking about bringing in people experiencing homelessness themselves uh, to guide this policy, right? Yeah. Have the people who are directly impacted, the people who are already working with nonprofits and other just mutual aid community groups doing this kind of work, letting them lead the way. And that's the opposite of what we are seeing from Mayor Bass. Uh, Once again, do you think that Mayor Bass is in the position that Hillary was in, that she feels like she's got to act a certain way in order to... More so, because she's a black woman, right? I mean, she Mm -hmm. Hillary at least has a range of... more range of emotion that she can express in public, right, without being so scrutinized. So... Yeah, you you know, you have to give Mayor Bass that. You know, she's she's up against people's prejudices, even though she won overwhelmingly. These prejudices still exist in people who voted for her, right? <laughs> you know? She won like three times. Yeah, right. Yeah. She you know <laughs> and she, she and it, which is which is what kind of blows me away about her. It's like, girl, we don't want these other people. Yeah. There was just be just reflect what LA wants. Yeah, I, I didn't understand the refusal to bring in more leftist folks because we all support people who are not a hundred percent in line with us ideologically, right? I mean most of us do, right? Some people just don't mess with electoral politics at all, and that's their jam. Yeah. Right. But most of us who do are willing to support people who we have more things in common with than not. Right. right. And that's how I viewed Bear Bass. But I guess that's not how she views me. You know? <laughs> uh, do you have hope for her, though? Do you think she may warm up to this position? I'm and- hoping that she does. I'm hoping that, you know, we're able to push her and, and help her see that she doesn't need, you know, especially with Caruso out of the picture. You know, maybe she would feel like she has more freedom to step away from that kind of hardline, you know, criminalization rhetoric and 
maybe embrace a a more you know <laughs> a compassionate approach you know that that is my hope right i don't i don't know if we'll see that but you know well because if la wanted a hard line they would have gone for rick caruso yeah did to me that's a no-brainer right i mean he did not win and he he lost handedly you know and it's upsetting to me as a person that he he did very well in the san fernando valley but you know that's another thing about cd6 nuri's former district you know there's parts of that district that did go for karen bass right mm -hmm. and the same with cd2 cd2 overwhelmingly you know parts of cd4 as well went for karen bass so the idea that the entire valley went for rick caruso is not valid right Let's talk about Rick, uh, Rick Russo for a second. <laughs> oh, do we have to? <laughs> we don't have to. Do you not want to? No, no, I do. I do. I want to talk about him for a couple reasons. Yeah. First, it's shocking to me that you can spend $100 million. $110 million. <laughs> and lose. And lose. Yes. And you built two malls that people love. Yeah, everybody loves the fucking Grove and the Americana brand. And you're a handsome billionaire. Yeah. I mean, like it checks a lot of the boxes for yeah. why people, especially in it. I love L.A., obviously. Yeah. But but we don't, we're not the greatest voters for local no. politics. And so you would think of any city he could sneak a win in over this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, and that's actually that's absolutely what he banked on. He banked and on. And yet he, he lost by way more than he should have. The only okay. So I want to ask you this. It seems like the only time that he gained ground on Karen was when he tried to associate her with the Church of Scientology. Yes, the Scientology shit did resonate with some voters. Yeah. Was that surprising to you that that worked? No, because, you know, there are a lot of strong feelings about Scientology in this city, right? And let's be honest, there's a lot of religious bigotry in general, right? I mean, you would think as a Catholic person that Rick Caruso wouldn't, you know, engage in that kind of thing. <laughs> because it was uh, definitely a bigger deal to be a Catholic 50 years ago in American politics. And, you know, he was absolutely around back then, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I mean, yeah. do, we, do we think that they're still not protecting priests in the Catholic Church. Yeah, I, you know, from from way grosser crimes. Yeah, yeah. Than well, I mean, Scientology. You know, there there have been documentaries about Scientology, and mm -hmm. you know, it's it's seen as a real uh, influence in local politics here, and it really doesn't have the same influence anywhere else in the country, right? I mean, in Washington, yes, but. You know, you don't go in Utah and there's a, like, there's down the street from here, there is a Scientology building the size of a college, right? <laughs> it's, you know. Well, it used to be a hospital. <laughs> right. Okay. So, yeah. you know, that just doesn't exist in other parts of the country, right? Yeah. This is, it's a, Scientology is a very LA thing. You know? But yet, but yet almost all the politicians go over there. They go over there. The, they the, get the donations. The old sheriff was there. They, they get donations from Scientology. Garcetti has been there. Garcetti's been there a million times. I know. There's there's lots of footage of almost every politician you think of, especially Mitchell Farrell. Him right? too. Because that was in his district. He was yeah. there all the time. So it, they're part of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, which is kind of funny, right? It's like, are you a business? Are you not? You know? But, oh yeah, yeah. Huh. But, I mean, you can be a member as a nonprofit. I don't know what their designation oh, is as right. as a chamber member. But so, you know. so do you see other um, would be candidates attacking their challengers if if they can dig up some video of them? Shaking hands over there? Uh, I guess so. I mean, but I, it didn't. It didn't win it for Caruso, though. It still didn't you know? win. So yeah, it, it still didn't win it, and it was on ad nauseum, right? Like all, anybody who watches regular TV saw that shit nonstop. <laughs> My mom saw it, and she doesn't even live in the city. She lives in Simi, you know. So she was being bombarded by the Caruso yeah. ads, and she couldn't even vote for the guy. Okay. You know? Do you think that the overabundance of ads ruined it for him, too? I, I do think that, that, yeah, people started to wonder why he felt the need to supersaturate the airwaves the way they did. I mean, he didn't do it as bad in the general as he did in the primary. In the primary, it was obscene, yeah. right? Every door you would knock on in the valley would have a stack of Caruso mailers <laughs> next to the door or in the trash. 
you know, and that was just wild when, and that there were a lot of people confused about him at the time. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not even necessarily canvassing for a mayoral candidate and people would say, so what do you think of this Rick Caruso? Yeah. You know, what, what who, what is he about? He's a Democrat. I'm confused, you know? So, and what would you say? Uh, you know, I'm not canvassing for that campaign, but you know, I would be very skeptical of somebody who's spending, you know, at the time he'd spent like 45 million, you know, and he is a real estate developer. So, you know, I, is that really what we want for our city? Haven't we heard this story before the billionaire <laughs> real estate developer of, you know, a questionable ideologies, right? Yeah. So yeah, you know. Do you think that Caruso, because my belief is if Caruso just ran as a Republican. Yeah, he would have done way better, right? I, do I you know. think? Yeah, I do. Because he had, to, he had to spend so much time, especially after we highlighted that, right? We had repeatedly attacked him for it. He had to spend a lot of his time and resources trying to convince voters that he had made a genuine change, right? right. Did, did you get that letter in the mail? It was like a like a regular standard letter that said... You know, I am Red Caruso. I used to be a Republican, and here I changed it. As soon as I got that letter, I was like, oh, this fucker is finished. You know, if you have to spend money to explain to people why you're on their side, on their political party, you should have just run as a Republican, bro. Like, yeah. objectively, I'm glad he didn't because I'm glad he shot himself in the foot, right? right? But, like, as a political strategist, yeah, that that just made no sense whatsoever. Right. Yeah. We've seen other people do this, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, this is... To, so like, uh, um, the people on Twitter like to call him Joey Buckets. Yeah. He, he yesterday, or maybe it was today, it, um, uh, announced that he's going to be part of a Republican uh, lobby yeah, firm. Yeah, go, go figure, yeah, right? right. Yeah. It, and, and it's like, come on, you're a cop. Yeah. You, and you, he made a big thing in his campaign for mayor that he was a Democrat. You know, he's a Democrat for mayor. Yeah. And he's a Tracy Park Democrat. You know, that's <laughs> so. OK, so here's here's my question for you, though. I feel like L.A. is open minded enough that if you truly are a Republican and you can you can you can say I'm a Republican, but I believe in the women's right to choose. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I'm a Republican, but yes, I think would endear the Republicans for sure to come out. Right. But also, you might get some people on the fence who are like, you know, I'm not happy with you, what Garcetti you, did. Yeah, you will get the libs. You will get some libs. You get some for libs sure. over yeah. there, right? You get some libs. You get some shit libs. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> shit libs. <laughs> yeah. Call. You think that 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 going forward that people should just be honest about that yes that is you know that that's the old adage right honesty is the best policy and especially as a candidate your messaging to be conflated like that that's like the worst nightmare right message discipline is such a big part of campaigning yes you know yeah and that just screws up your whole narrative right there <laughs> Let's talk about the DSA. Okay. The DSA stands for what? Democratic Socialists of America. Socialists. Socialists. Democratic Socialists, but Socialists. I think I like socialism, don't I? I, I think so, too. I think socialism I've, I've got has a Bernie some, poster behind me. Yeah, I think I socialism. see around here somewhere. Socialism is alive and well in this apartment. <laughs> and so... Um, <laughs> But it's also alive and well in America. It, and it's very alive and well in this city. Thank you very we much. We went to public schools. Yep. The mailman just brought me my mail. Yep. You know, like... Yep, there's a street light out here somewhere, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it's kind of nice. During COVID, a whole bunch of people gave us money. Yep, right. K kind of nice when your trash gets picked up, you know? <laughs> okay, so the DSA of L.A. is... Who, who, is there a main person for the DSA of LA? Uh, my understanding is it's a, it's like a committee. It's sort of like a board that makes most of the, I, I think it's called like the advisory committee or something. I don't, I'm not really aware of the internal structure of the organization, but it's not like a literal dictatorship where there's just one person at the very top. And so it's, it's truly socialist. In theory, yeah. I mean, it really, if, to be socialist, it would there'd be no hierarchy at all, right? It yeah. would be horizontally organized, and there would be no, you know, superior body that makes decisions, right? The reason I'm bringing it up, well, first of all, are you part of this? Uh... I am not. I have never been. I have lots of friends who are. Oh, you do? Yes, I do. Great. I've, I've worked for candidates who were members. 
so I'm bringing it up for you because you are so much more educated about local politics than I am. Okay. We've got our guy, William. Film the police. The second, the second episode we ever That's did. That's right. We love you, William. We love William. William doesn't like the DSA. Right. And I would think that outsiders would think that William is as far left, a left-wing extremist. Oh, for sure he would get labeled that way. That, yeah, that you sure. would find out there, right? Yeah. And yet he doesn't like the DSA and there's some anonymous members out there of the DSA that um, – uh, try to troll him, which is foolish. He's uh, yeah, he's, he's so good. He's on the master, so I don't even know why you all try. You know, <laughs> you're just gonna get smoked. What advice would you have for the DSA in regards to dealing with William? I mean, William just made a very simple point initially, just stating the fact that everybody could see with their own two eyes that there was a picture of a large DSA event, and there were like two black people in the picture, and his comment was just hey there's like no black people here and to me the way to approach that is to say you're right you know we we need to do something about that we need to examine why that is how the folks in our organization feel are we doing anything that's you know preventing people from feeling you know accepted in this space and bringing them into this space so it was a very to me i mean yeah maybe it's not something you want to say as an organization hey we've got this problem but it was also something that had come up before okay mm. so there was a a group of folks who had uh, an afro dsa caucus i don't remember the exact name of it but you know it was a group of black folks in the organization that were trying to do you know their own thing and they left the group because of the anti-blackness hmm. that will was referring to so this wasn't the first rodeo was anti-blackness within the organization. So to me, especially after this has already been discussed publicly, yeah. when a black man tells you this is upsetting, that the opposite way to address it is to <laughs> try and attack him personally and right. you know assassinate his character and, and send a troll army after him and all that. It was just like, thanks for proving Will right. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, anti-blackness. Uh, anti-blackness has come up in City Hall with Nuri and Kevin right. DeLeon. Yeah. And Gil Cedillo, let's not forget there Gil. There you go. Gil's gone. Bye, Gil. <laughs> What's Kevin doing? I, I don't fucking know. I mean, the only thing I can think is that he, he truly believes that he will not be removed in a recall because he has survived a recall effort before. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think we need to keep in mind that, you know, as soon as he got in there, just like Nithya and George Gascon, there was a recall initiated against Kevin DeLeon. But that's because conservatives in L.A., that's the only way that that's they the, can compete. That's their last recourse. They don't like the results of election. They try to recall somebody. Be, it, because, and, and, but but it's, it's actually a, a smart strategy because in a recall election, there's far fewer turnout already. There, if, if it was a good strategy, though, I think it would have worked. And it hasn't worked <laughs> yet, you know. But again, if I'm going to fight a war... <laughs> Right. I'm going to go on the weakest part of the yeah, that I yeah. can. And that is kind right. of the weakest part in L.A. Yeah. Is the recall election. Right. It's cheesy as hell. It, it, it's not democratic. It's yeah, not American. It's, it, the, the rules I should mean, probably be I mean, to, to recall somebody after two years in office, I think is fair. To recall somebody literally as soon as they took the oath of office is not fair. <laughs> right. And that's a bipartisan position. Yes. Right? I mean, come on. Okay. So... You think Kevin thinks he can win this? Yeah, I think he thinks he can just ride it out. I think he believes that as long as he kind of lays low and keeps doing what could be considered on paper council business, yeah. that it'll all just kind of blow over. You huh. know, he's got two years to wait it out. He's not afraid of a recall because he survived it before. It is a very high threshold, right? It mm -hmm. is difficult. They need 27,000 signatures of folks in his district. Yeah. And that's just the beginning. That's just to initiate the recall process. Um, w right now, you're knocking on doors for who? Antoinette Scully. Did you have to get signatures for her? Yes, we did. How many did you get? We got 678 signatures, valid signatures. Right. We so 27,000 to recall somebody is a lot. Is a ton, yes. Even in the city of millions. Yeah, it, it is because they all have to be in that district. That's part of what makes oh, it so you challenging. You need 27,000 in Kevin's in district? In his district. That's what makes it such a high threshold. What district is his? He is CD14. 
That's Eagle Rock. Uh, Boyle Heights, uh, parts of downtown, right? Like Civic Center area, that's that's CD14. Do you think you could get 27000 if you had to? I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of money because it has to be paid signature gathering, right? You have to have folks out there eight hours a day to get that amount of signatures, yeah. When you have gotten signatures for people, did they... Did they pay you or their campaign pay you for your time? For signatures, no. I mean, signatures is, is in a campaign is, is the very beginning of the process, mm. right? So it's it's usually before you've launched any kind of paid field operation, unless you have financial backing of, of folks to help you out or you take out a personal loan. That happens sometimes too. Interesting. Right? As a candidate, sometimes f- folks choose to do that, and that's obviously a risk on their part, right? So when Caruso was taking out personal loans, <laughs> in, in a way, that's what he was doing well, for he this. He gave right? himself one hundred and ten million dollars. Yeah, it was a and personal loan. And then paid loan. people to to work for him. Well, yeah, he he had more than one field company subcontracted to do his. He had an enormous field operation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, when we're talking about. Um, Eight hour day mm-hmm. paid signature people. Are these people in front of my Vons? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Interesting. Yeah. A lot of those folks that you see, they're, you know, they're, they're either working for a union that's working on a ballot initiative. Oh. You know, that, that's very common. Right? Are they required to say if they're getting paid if I ask them? I don't think so. I mean, you know, I guess it depends on the organization and their, you know. Because I. I... I do go to Walmart a lot. I right. probably shouldn't. <laughs> but, but almost every time that I do, there's some guy out there right. who's saying lies to people. Yeah. And and I don't want to engage, but I, I have to sometimes. Right, yeah. And I'm like, nothing that, nothing that I sign is going to X, Y, and Z, whatever it is that you're talking about. Right. Um, I kind of wish that there was some transparency there. Yeah, there, there should be transparency. And a lot of these things are, you know, the way that they're worded is very confusing. It, you think that you're doing something helpful and it's the opposite. It's, right. it's like, you know, the Prop 8 example, right? Like, you know, speaking of the Obama era, right, where it's something that is so confusing that if you vote yes, it means no, and no, it means yes. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's that kind of thing. And that's, you know... It's very confusing as a voter. It's even more confusing when it's just talking to somebody outside of a Walmart, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Kevin's going to stay. Uh, according to Kevin. <laughs> well, well, okay. But you think he's got two years to, to run out the clock. He's, he, he's up in 2024 and I guarantee you that he thinks he's going to survive that long. And so if there was a, some miracle happens. And they get those signatures. Please yeah. get those signatures. <laughs> when would the recall be? Uh, probably, I, I mean, the timing of it is is not like set in stone, but it would probably be towards the end of the year. Mm. Or it could end up being very close to when his actual election would be, mm. right? So it would feel a little, sort of like the Bonin recall, right? Yeah. Had the Bonin recall survived, it would have literally been like, I think, two weeks before his actual term was up anyway. Which is a waste of money. Right. It's it's hard. That's another reason why it's hard to do these things, because it's hard to justify the cost of mm. that kind of election when there's literally another election. And right so there's then. just not enough political pressure on him to... I mean, he didn't capitulate when the president of the United States said to resign. <laughs> I mean, when have you ever seen a president get involved in like local politics like this, right? Like that? low yeah that that low you know it just doesn't happen unless it's something truly egregious right and Nuri martinez you know to her credit took that cue and left you know she she did try to weasel around it and take a paid leave and then she she just you know she left and you mm-hmm. know please kevin do the same you know <laughs> is this is this one of the i i don't want to put people in buckets but i always do Mm-hmm. Is this the difference between men and women? A little bit, yeah, because, you know, he definitely has the uh, abusive ex vibe. You know, the <laughs> the way that he talks about the situation is very much the way that physically and emotionally abusive men talk to their partners, right? I have to be part of your healing process. It's like, you know, I hit you, baby, but we have to figure out why, you know? Like, what did you do that provoked me to hit you? You know, it's that type of approach that he's taking that I'm not the only woman who feels that way. I've had a lot of women who said, oh, no, 
that he is absolutely like you can tell. Yeah. You know, yeah. Wearing a Santa's hat. He was he choked a guy. Yeah, he 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 tried to tackle Jason. Yeah. You know this guy. I do know Jason. I don't know Jason well, but you know, Jason is a comrade. Jason is a, a wonderful activist. He's a parent, mm. you know, and he's faced a lot of really unfair treatment at City Hall. You know, uh, Foible, the, you know, city attorney rep who's always there, blamed Jason for blocking the doors at City Hall on the record when he wasn't in the fucking building. You want to talk about anti-blackness at City Hall? He just saw a black guy in the audience and he's like, oh, it must be Jason, you know? Like, yeah. what the fuck is that? Right. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, thank you for segueing into the City Hall uh, activists. Right. <laughs> Are they doing it right? I mean, what what else, what other recourse do you have? You know, you you have a, a city council that is, you know, continuing to have meetings, right? And I understand that city business needs to go on, but I also understand that Kevin DeLeon needs to go. And at this point, I don't see any other leverage than his city council seat. Does the council have? Do they have a lever that they could pull that they're just not pulling None. yet? They have no lever that they can pull. There's nothing in the city charter that allows for like removal of, you know, a delinquent member or whatever. I mean, there are some instances where somebody could be removed, but it's really complicated. It's there's nothing. And, and so know, there's okay, really so, no way that they can just get him, get rid of him that way. So you've got the activists who are saying, shut it down. Right. And you got the council who are saying, we, yeah, we can shut it down, but then what is there? We have no power over this guy right I now. I mean, they could, just to see what happens, try not having any meetings, you know? There will be no, you know, moving forward with any city business, Kevin, until you resign. They have not tried that. Please, it's on the table, right? It, you could just try it. If it doesn't work, fine, we go back to the drawing board. But, you know, let's give it a shot, right? Nothing else has worked. What do we have to lose? A standoff. It, that right. it, would, it would force it, it into a standoff. Not only is it, well, it, it yes, but also right now I feel like the council has the advantage in that the activists are being demonized by the paper. Oh, yeah. All, and by yeah, other all politicians. The legacy, yeah, all the legs. And Paul Krikorian hates all of us. He, he hates the cowbell, you know. <laughs> Did Krikorian always have an issue with activists yeah he's never he's never he's a total you know stooge of the LAPPL you know he doesn't like any of us you know he's have you, have you ever been to the tiny home communities in his district it looks like a prison and there's LAPD on site 24 7 and I'm not a fan of all of those sites you know but there are other sites in the city that are not run the way that Paul Krikorian chooses to run his he's uh, wh wh what neighborhoods are his, is his he is CD2 so he has uh, NoHo, you know, most of NoHo, right? Sherman Oaks, uh, Studio City, you know. I mean, it's it's one of the wealthier, you know, districts mm -hmm. out outside of NoHo. I ask because right? I've I think I've only been to one or two of the tiny homes. One was in Kevin's district, okay, um, near Pasadena, like in between Eagle mm -hmm. Rock and Pasadena. Mm -hmm. The other one I saw was in um, Brentwood. Oh, okay, yeah. No, that's CD11. But even that one looked like a prison. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, over by the VA, right? And, and yeah. I feel like that's probably the best scenario of any of the tiny home situations. Not yeah. that there are any good solutions. No, I know. But right I mean, now that are happening. But but even that one, because it's behind the fence right. at the VA. Yep, yep. And it kind of feels like mm -hmm. they're not really allowed to like... Wander. Yeah, yeah, it's not the same thing as the people who are, already live on the property at the VA because there are plenty of people who do live there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, there are some in CD three that you know are not great, but they also don't have a twenty four seven LAPD presence, mm -hmm. which you know, to me, thinking as a resident, would be very threatening, right? You know, you're you're in here and, and you're supposed to be being safe and, you know, getting your affairs in order and blah, 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 and, you know, transitioning off the street and you have a constant threat of a gun and violence and mm -hmm. and being kicked out right back on the street. So it's, you know. <laughs> Let's uh, wrap up our pol politics uh, segment with the police. 
<laughs> my favorite folks. Our mayor seems to, tr- she seems like she's trying to figure out a way to hire Michael Moore again. Yeah, and it's, it's she's trying really hard. Yeah, she she wants it. <laughs> Who do you think would be a better alternative? Is there anybody that stands out to you? The, no. There's nobody at the LAPD that no. you've had a positive experience with. No. There's, so they've got to go outside of LA. There well, it, I mean that that's the thing is it's you know, it's 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 an impossible you can't reform it. You know, and it, it, changing who's at the top isn't isn't really going to make a material difference. You know, that person is still going to, you know, protect cops who, who kill people, you know, choose not to to prosecute, choose not to even use language that, that you know, they, they have a huge PR budget. They choose how they frame situations. And if you think the chief has nothing to do with that, then you're wrong. You know, just choosing to be transparent about, you know, how we describe interactions between people and police, you know, and, and, and another example of why it really doesn't matter is, you know, what happened with, you know, Valentina and Moore himself saying that, you know, the three shots were not, you know, in LAPD policy. And then the police commission says, no, one of them was and two of them weren't, you know, so what, what good is a chief if, you know, what the chief finds is, you know, invalidated by this other body, you know, so it's a. Mm -hmm. Also, there was people in the store. Yes. And they're on the second floor. Yeah, you don't shoot into a retail store, as especially when there was no threat of immediate, you know, death, right? He's not even, Daniel is far from the victim. The victim's laying on the ground. Daniel is at a distance and he still fires. William Dorsey Jr. Still mm-hmm. fires and, and well, but, but again, my issue is you're upstairs. No matter what mm-hmm. he's doing upstairs, you've got cops downstairs yeah. to, to grab them and, when it's time to grab them. Right. And they, and they knew that they weren't going into an active shooter situation. That's in the 911, you know, audio and, and you hear in the body cam footage, you know, you hear the other officers saying, William, you know, slow down, Jones, slow down. Right. So, you know, he doesn't listen to the other officers and he is still collecting an LAPD paycheck and he is a football coach at Saugus High School. Hmm. Yeah. If anybody wants to visit. (laughs) Well, football's over, sadly, right now. Yeah, right. It's not football season anymore, Williams. Let's talk about Chatsworth. All right. <laughs> what is when people say Chatsworth? What do, what do they? What usually goes through their mind? Do you think they think of porn, weed, and the Manson family? Why weed? Uh, there's a lot of like shitty warehouse space in Chatsworth, <laughs> and a lot of it used to be used for porn production, and now it's grow houses. Really? Yeah. There's a lot of grow houses in the area. So it's, I, it's also relatively cheap, you know, land, whatever, to, you know, have a little spot and grow. So I had a friend, um, I guess it was 10 years ago, uh, knocking on doors for the census. Oh, okay. And she was shocked at how much weed she smelled going door to door. Yeah. <laughs> Did you experience, do you experience that when you oh, yeah, knock on yeah, doors? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. People open the door and you can smell it or they're, like, they're I had a guy open the door and he had his lighter and his, you know, his, he had his shit in his hand and everything. So, yeah, you know, I've walked into a garage and there was like, you know, four young dudes having their sesh, you know. So, yeah, it's just, you know, that's just part of L.A. culture, right? right. Like you knock on doors, you're going to get weed, you know, like. Uh, do you run across porn stars in Chatsworth? I probably have and I just didn't recognize them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the third one was the Mansons. Right, the Manson family, but it is it is also known as a white supremacist community. Oh, that too. Yeah, the the SFV Peckerwoods are active. In, oh, hold on, SFV Peckerwoods. Yeah, San Fernando Valley Peckerwoods. Peck, they call themselves that. Yes, they do. That's pretty brave. Or, yeah, I don't know what you would call that. Brave, stupid. <laughs> all I mean, wrong. they're owning it. 
Uh, they are owning it, yeah. You know, I mean, I first encountered the, you know, skinhead white supremacist gangs when I was in high school, you know. So as a as a white person, you know, I was, like, seen as a potential recruit, right? Mm. You know, and even though there, there are a lot of folks, at least when I encountered them as a teenager, that were not white that were involved in these groups too like latinos uh, mostly latinos yeah i didn't i never i never ran across a black person who was involved but yes you know people who were latino people who were you know from you know like i i ran into folks from iran who were you know cool with white supremacy they wanted and, to be peckerwoods uh yeah you know i mean there's you know iran and and the word aryan you know they're you know identified together so there are some folks of that lineage background who consider themselves white and you know adopt the ideals of white supremacy they wanted to fit so, in to fit in and and just to feel superior to other people and oh. and also you know it has a lot to do with drugs right i mean they're running dope that's you know you, you, do you really care who you're running dope with you know do you really care the color of their skin right mm. now because it's not really about you know camaraderie it's about that paper right so mm. it's like you know well, we'll we'll be cool with you because you got the good shit, you know. So. Okay, so Chatsworth is known for those things yes. in a lot of people's minds. Right. What would you say is the reality? I mean, that is kind of the reality. It's, you know, there's it's it's a weird neighborhood because, you know, you ha you do have a lot of homeowners who want to pretend that they live in the 1950s in a small midwestern town. <laughs> it's one of the only parts of the whole city where you can have horses. Right. So Ooh. that, yeah. Right. So that's a huge thing with like the neighborhood council people and stuff like that is, you know, maintaining horse property. So you get this kind of like wealthy equestrian set and then you get these like down and dirty warehouses where people are shooting porn and growing weed. And, you know, <laughs> so it's a it's a very like dichotomous kind of neighborhood. Right. <laughs> so kind of anything goes. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of an anything goes sort of sort of area, but it's in a, a very purple you know, city council district represented by the only Republican on the whole city council. Who's that? Uh, Stafford B, a.k.a. John Lee, uh, my my city council member. And, you know, when we talk about changing parties, you know, John Lee pulled a Rick Caruso before Rick Caruso. You know, he changed his political party. He was a Republican. He changed it to independent right before a primary election that he knew was going to be very heavy Dem turnout in March of 2020. So, you know, that, that whole thing of deceiving voters, you know, you can thank Staffer B for that, that strategy, right? <laughs> I've, I've seen you call him Staffer B on Twitter. That's right. What does that refer to? So we call him Staffer B because if you read the Mitchell Englander indictment, Mitchell Englander was the council member of that district, and he resigned, and he was later arrested. He was involved in a federal bribery case, right? He was part of the Huisar investigation, FBI investigation, and he was the chair of the Plum Committee, Planning and Land Use. So this is when um, uh, builders of, like, skyscrapers and, yes. like, big-time builders, yes. developers. Yes, real estate developers. Paid off politicians in so, LA. Yeah, they paid off almost everybody at City Hall, let's be honest, right? Especially the guy who's the chair of the Pump Committee, right? I mean, on the Pump Committee, chair of the Pump Committee, you know, so yeah, he was taking bribes from real estate developers, and John Lee was his chief of staff at the time, hmm. and the biggest, you know, bribery scandal involved a trip to Las Vegas, a free trip to Vegas, paid for by developer A in the indictment, that included, you know, bottles, dinner, they, they had like a 12000 dollar tab of wine or whatever their bar tab was that that's a lot and of that's a lot of drinking there was a lot of drinking and there was some prostitution oh. supposedly john lee didn't you know engage in that that was just englander but anyway the point is that they did this they did not report it to the you know ethics commission like they were supposed to as gifts or whatever the fbi interviews englander englander tells lee and lee backdates checks to the fbi to try and cover their tracks the amount that he used was way under under what their actual you know bill would have been but that's what he tried to do so he lied to the fbi and you know he didn't face any repercussions in this whole you know hmm. this whole incident how, how do you think he got off the hook i am almost positive that he exchanged information for prosecutorial immunity you know oh, he snitched right? right right he snitched which is you know okay fine but to still be a city council member to still sit on the plump committee he's still involved in the plump committee at the very least you would think that you would expel somebody who takes bribes for real estate developers from the plum committee right okay 
Our man Kenneth. Uh huh. Kenneth Mejia. That's right. The new controller of That's LA. That's right. Probably the first time that anybody knew who the hell the controller of LA was. Oh yeah, who, no. Who, who's who's not knocking on doors? Yeah, right. Could he analyze what's going on with Staffer B going forward so that he doesn't get his hand stuck in the cookie jar again? I mean, you know, I'm sure Ken- Kenneth is a brilliant guy. I'm sure he'd come up with some creative ways to shine a light on. <laughs> You know, or at, least, or at least the plum committee. Like, well, yeah, just you know, to look at the plum committee, to look at the donations that the you know council members on that committee have received, because you know, if you're getting money from real estate development, even in a you know quote through you know the quote unquote proper channels, right? That's still a conflict of interest. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, it's not against the law, but you know, in my opinion, it's a it's a conflict of interest. You are so fascinating to talk with, in part because you know so much. Uh, What do you want to do in the future with all this knowledge of local politics? Do you want to be a staffer? Do you want to be staffer C for somebody? <laughs> what, what do you want? I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind being a staffer for somebody, but um, you know, my main goal is to take out Staffer B. You know, get rid of him in 2024. You know, we're working with Antoinette's campaign to you know try and get real representation in CD6. So you know, that's sort of how I see my role anyway is just you know helping good folks get into positions of power. So for the next year and a half, at least, maybe mm-hmm. two years, right? You, your, your main focus is to work for her, work with her, right? Uh, to unseat this Republican. Yeah, unseat John Lee. We want to replace get... replace him with a black woman. <laughs> well, do you think that that's likely? In CD12, probably not. I mean, uh, the dynamics of CD12 are very different than CD6. You know, it's definitely a, a purple district. You know, these are Democrats who voted for Republican John Lee, right? It's a, you know, it's, it. the word Democrat means something different in Granada Hills to a lot of people than it does in, you know, Sun Valley or, you know. Do these voters not know that he's Stafford B? A lot of them don't. And, um, you know, that that he is vulnerable because a lot of them are unhappy with him in that, you know, he hasn't fulfilled his word and, you know, removed every unhoused person from the district. Right? Was that one of his promises? It wasn't a promise, but, you know, he did have a homelessness deputy who viewed his role as that. Right. He was there to just tell me where they are so I can send the cops on them. You know, his name is Colin Cruz. (laughs) But yeah, you know, it's just... It's just something that he he hasn't outright said, at least as far as I know, but that is heavily implied because if you look at what he does as a legislator, he does not legislate. He co-signs other people's bills and they're terrible and he bans RVs and that's it. He's the least active city council member. So he is vulnerable in a lot of ways. And the more you share the Stafford B story, the more people are unhappy with him. And I have talked to Lee voters who do know about the Stafford B story and say, I wish I had known that before I voted for him, which Mm -hmm. was possible. The FBI chose to wait a week after that election to come out with this information about Mitch Englander. So it's really, really hard for me to believe that that wasn't, you know, convenient timing, right? (laughs) That all makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, he, he is, he is definitely vulnerable and, you know, we just need the right person to step in who will be, you know, palpable to the voters in the district, but, you know, who's able to really highlight what a piece of shit he is, you know? <laughs> okay, let's wrap it up with good things about Chatsworth. Good things. Good things about Chatsworth. What are your favorite parts of Chatsworth? Um, I, I love the parks. It's a, it's a great place to be if you like hiking, if you like, you know, nature photography, which I do. I love infrared photography, and it's a really cool place to, you know, just go explore stuff like that. Um, here's a weird thing about Chatsworth that you wouldn't expect. There's a really good Jamaican restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds crazy because it's like all. a white neighborhood. What's it and called? It's called 1876 Caribbean. It's off of Lassen and DeSoto. And what a random name. It, it's a random name, but you go in there and those <laughs> folks are almost all from Jamaica and they are rocking it in Chatsworth and they make their own juice, you know, and it's kick ass. I love the pineapple ginger 
And it's just not what you'd expect from Chatsworth, right? Should I order like uh, jerk chicken? They they have jerk chicken. They have oxtail. If you like oxtail, that's, you know, that my favorite thing are the patties, you know, like the beef patties and they have a jerk chicken patty, a curry chicken patty. Those are fire. You should definitely get those. <laughs> and they make like amazing mac and cheese, but you have to like, you, you should really like pre-order it because it takes a while. You know, everything is made like fresh in house. So, you know, it takes longer than your other spot. There's one eight seven six caribbean yeah and there's another um soul food restaurant in chatsworth <gasps> that is called lay sisters uh barbecue and that's like a staple that's been there for a long time i think it opened in the 70s and you know it's it's really close to devonshire and topanga and they just opened up another location not too far but you know that they got your standard you know ribs they have the best hush puppies get the hush puppies okay. for sure um yeah, they, they have, they started like, you know, fried chicken sandwiches to get on like that Popeye's train and stuff. So, you know, they they just have really, really good food. And it's, you know, it's a black owned business in, in the community that's beloved, you know. This is why I do this podcast. <laughs> The last thing I thought <laughs> is is soul food and Jamaican food, right? Yeah, I know, I know. It's it's funny. It, it's it's funny how that works. But hey, you know they're there and more power to them, because you know they're. I think that they're you know the lifeblood of the community. There's another. There's a, a restaurant that I love called uh, Mother of India, and it's you know it's the woman who runs it, Bharti. She's a wonderful woman. She's an immigrant, you know, and she makes. Uh, that's like all her like home cooking Indian food. You know, I'm not sure what region is. I think it's South Indian food is, is like the, you know, the focus of it, but yeah, it's, it's also really, really good. And something you probably wouldn't expect in Chatsworth. It's really close to Devonshire and independence. Nice. Catherine, God bless you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you for coming all the way over here. I'm going <laughs> to drive you home. <laughs> see, see what a great guy he is. Well, Sorry. <laughs> I mean, the rain is, has mellowed a little bit, but a little we're bit. about to get hit hard for the next 24 hours, right? Probably, yeah. And as much as I appreciate you taking public transportation, um, <laughs> I'm going to help you out a little bit today. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for all that you do. And once again, who should we be thinking about uh, for uh, CD6? CD6 is Antoinette Scully. You're going to vote for Antoinette Scully. She's a mom. You know, she's a mother of two. She's a tenant. She has direct experience with people experiencing homelessness as a case manager at NoHo Home Alliance in North Mm. Hollywood. So she has the right experience and leadership skills. You know, Antoinette is an amazing leader. If Antoinette hears this, you're welcome to be on the Anto- this podcast. Antoinette, we need to get you on here. Yeah, Antoinette would be a great guest. And as you can tell, I ask a whole bunch of just <laughs> insane questions. Yeah, no, this is this is fun, and this this would be a great way for folks to get to know Antoinette in the district. Right on. Thanks again for all that you do. Thank you, Tony, for having me. All right. How great was Catherine? You know who we'd eat jerk chicken and soul food with? Our Patreons. When you stoke us, you're saying, Tony, Jordan, we can't knock on doors for you, but we can send you all the moolah you need. So shout out to our Patreons, Nancy Rommelman, Sean Atlow, Matt Mills, Sean Wallace, Greg and Molly, Jamie Taylor, Mark Johnson, Kira Ann, Barney Grinky, Ben Welsh, Jen Adams, Trevor Wilson, Bree Wild, Dougie Gyro, Christina Up North, Robin Carey, Adam Shorn, and Ben from Down Under. To be a Patreon, go to patreon.com slash here in LA and give till it almost hurts. We're also looking for cool guests like Catherine. If you know someone who lives in a neighborhood in LA, not a city, and has a good story to tell or an expertise that they can teach me about, have them write me at busblog at gmail.com. Also, shout out to our Angelinos, like our newest one, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. To be an Angelino, all you have to do is pay PAL or Venmo 25 bucks or more, and we will list you on the Here in LA website or Medium blog forever. Just send your hard-earned cash to busblog at gmail.com. Want to support us, but you went broke trying to be the next Mega Millions Millionaire? You can still help. Post your favorite episode on your Facebook. Oh my God, post two. Tweet something nice about this. In fact, anytime you see me tweet about an episode, retweet it. And for God's sakes, tell your friends. This is a great episode to start tweeting on. 
because everybody's going to love Catherine and everybody's going to love this story that she's got to tell. And it was such a pleasure to talk with her on a rainy day. Tell your friends how Here in L.A. is spelled and that it's on Apple Podcasts and Google and, oh, my God, even Amazon. Here in L.A. is produced by myself, Tony Pierce, and a man who played tennis with you, rain or shine, Jordan Katz. Editing, mixing, and music supervision by Jordan Katz. Songs by Orgone and Jordan Katz. Special thanks to Cindy, who might be leaving social media very soon, and I will miss her dearly. Special thanks to, for her for creating the logo, Jen for inspiring this, and excellent souls like Catherine who helped get some of the best candidates elected who in turn helped the people. Always, Always vote! vote.